Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Lee. I'm the Vice President of Research and Patient Programs at Crohn's and Colitis Canada. And I wanted to welcome all the um, audience members who have joined us tonight for our Gutsy Learning Series um, education webinar. Uh, tonight, um, I'm pretty excited uh, for two reasons. One, I have one of my colleagues joining me as who will be functioning, uh, working with me as a co-moderator, Angie Spesic, our Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So welcome, Angie. Thank you for uh, doing this with me tonight. And as well, very excited because of our topic for tonight, um, an area that I don't think we've covered through um, one of our education series uh, for a very long time. So very excited about our um, guest speaker tonight. But before we start, um, just some technical reminders. Uh, please remember that this webinar is being offered in both English and French uh, audio. And so for those of you who want to listen to uh, this webinar in French, uh, what you can do is if you uh, go over to the control panel of our, of our Zoom platform, there should be an option called interpretation, which is also um, with a, an icon that looks like a globe. If you click on that, you should be able to select French and voila, you will be able to hear us um, uh, with French interpretation. Technical problems. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, try refreshing your web page, website browser or relaunching the webinar. We also have a troubleshooting tips that was sent to you via email. And please, we encourage you to um, look at those troubleshooting tips as we cover quite a bit of uh, frequently um, uh, encountered problems. Otherwise, you can always uh, send us a, um, your concerns via our questions box. Please remember that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to those who register to this webinar. Um, uh, within 24 hours after broadcasting this webinar. And uh, they're also available and will be posted to our YouTube channel as well as our GLS video site on our website. Please know that these quick Q&A session at the end of the presentation by our guest speaker will be uh, comprised of um, questions that um, you as registrants and audience members have posed ahead of time during the registration in the registration form, as well as any live questions that um, might come our way uh, via the questions box. Okay, so uh, the topic for tonight's GLS is peri perianal disease and manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. We're bringing this to you uh, as part of our promise, um, which is to cure Crohn's disease and improve the quality of life of those living with these uh, diseases. And um, in order to meet this promise, we run a number of programs, both on the research front and the patient programs uh, front, including webinars and education events, one of which is our COVID-19 webinar series. And the next one is scheduled for April, 2021, the exact date uh, to be determined. Of course, it's gonna be moderated by Drs. Gil Kaplan and Eric Benchmull. You may wish to register for this one. Uh, it is, um, it will be on uh, more details about the vaccine updates. I'm sure you've heard a lot on the news these days about um, the NACI and our Public Health Agency of Canada recommendations. And we will be having a panel of guest experts in this area who will be available to um, answer any questions you may have. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Jeffrey McCurdy, who is a gastroenterologist and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa. Dr. McCurdy received his PhD in immunology from Dalhousie University in 2004 and his MD from the University of Ottawa in 2007. He completed his internal medicine and gastroenterology training at Dalhousie University. Following this, he completed an advanced fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease at Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 2013. He joined the Department of Medicine Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Ottawa in 2013. His research interests include understanding and identifying predictors of disease related outcomes in inflammatory bowel disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McCurdy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angie. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And so, um, Angie and Kate, can you see my cursor if I am pointing things out? Yes. 
Oh, okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank all the attendees as well for joining us tonight. This is um, a very important topic for uh, Crohn's disease. I'm excited to be presenting because it's also one of my research areas. So I hope you enjoy and learn something tonight. So um, here are my disclosures. I, I have been, I have served as a consultant for a number of pharmaceutical companies and I have given presentations for them. So I hope over the next 40 to 45 minutes, take you through a tour of perianal Crohn's disease. And really the, the reason that this topic is so important is because for many patients, it can be really a devastating phenotype of Crohn's disease and it can be quite difficult to treat. So we'll, we'll take a tour through perianal Crohn's disease, the different types. I will try to explain why I think that this is a very important area to study and research. We'll talk about the treatment of perianal fistulas. We'll talk about how we can maximize current therapies. We'll also talk about some of the surgical options. And then I'm sure what everyone is really interested in, what's coming down the pipeline. So we'll talk about emerging therapies. Okay, so perianal Crohn's disease can have a variety of faces. In the top left corner, you can see this represents perianal skin tags. Now, not all patients who have uh, perianal skin tags will have Crohn's disease, but this is a very common manifestation of Crohn's disease. You can also develop ulcers, fissures, and then the dreaded, the perianal abscesses and fistulas. Because perianal fistulas are so difficult to treat, we're gonna focus on this for the rest of the talk. So what is a perianal fistula? A perianal fistula is shown here in this diagram and it's an abnormal connection between two surfaces. So you can see here the internal opening in the rectum. And this, there's a long tube-like structure with an external opening on the surface of the skin. So the buttock area. And in this example, you can see that the fistula tract traverses through this muscle complex. And so this is the muscle that surrounds the anus that helps us maintain continence. So why should we care about perianal fistulas? Well, first of all, they're very common. And so my first question for the audience is, have you or do you have a family member with Crohn's disease who has had a perianal fistula? So you can answer yes, no, not sure, or you're, not, you're still not sure what a perianal fistula is. Hi, everyone. We're having a technical problem with our polling right now. So if you'd like, go ahead and, and enter your responses in the chat box. Uh, I can see uh, a, lot of, a lot of you are responding yes. Yes, you, you yourself have experienced this or, or a family member. Um, unfortunately, we, we won't be able to do the polling for this question, but we will have some polling uh, further on. But I can see, again, many people are responding yes here in the chat, Dr. McCurdy. Okay, well, that, that supports the research then. So, um, so perianal, perianal Crohn's disease and perianal fistulas are very common. Um, so this is a study that was published back in 2002. It was conducted by one of my former mentors from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And what they found in a large population-based study is that after 20 years of having Crohn's disease, that approximately you had a 26% chance of developing a perianal fistula. And so um, other studies have demonstrated, have supported this. And, and so normally we tell patients that there's about a 30% chance that if you have Crohn's disease, that you will develop a perianal fistula. So it's very common. And I just want you to think about this for a minute. If we, if we think about um, inflammatory bowel disease to begin with, by year 2030, we expect in Canada 
that 1% of the Canadian population will have inflammatory bowel disease. And if you think roughly 50% of, of those patients will have Crohn's disease, well, if you do the math and 30% of patients with Crohn's disease have perianal fistulas, well, then that's a lot of Canadians who have perianal Crohn's disease. Oh, it looks like the poll is working now. Maybe we can skip that and go on. Okay. So although 78% with, with perianal fistulas, so there you go. And, and of, of course, we are going to have an overrepresented population uh, today with perianal Crohn's disease. But I think this just highlights that it is very common. So now, although I mentioned that roughly 30% of patients with Crohn's disease have perianal fistulas, the rates of perianal fistulas may be decreasing. So this is an up, updated study from the same group that I had mentioned from Mayo Clinic. And they found that if you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease after 1998, you had a lower chance of developing or you are less likely to develop perianal fistulas. And so why is 1998 important? Well, that's when the first biologic became commercially available and that was Remicade. And so the hypothesis is that if you're treated with biologics and if you're treated early in your disease course, that may prevent you from developing perianal fistulas. So perianal fistulas are common. They also are, are, it's a very morbid condition and can really, really impact patients. So here's an example of a patient with perianal fistulas and you can see all of the external openings. And so this would be a patient with very complex disease and you can imagine that there are probably abscesses underneath the skin. And so abscesses are infectious collections and you can think of it as a large pimple. And so those pimples can be very painful. Well, in addition to this, the tracts that are formed from these abscesses, these infections, can drain feculent material. And so this can be very distressing for patients. Here is an example after surgery. And so this patient went to surgery where the surgeons drained the perianal abscesses. And so I think you can appreciate from here that, again, this can be quite a morbid disease. So we've talked about some of the impacts on patients in terms of symptoms. It can cause pain, irritation, chronic drainage of fecal matter. It can also result in recurrent infections, which can be very dangerous as this can lead to sepsis. And this can have a variety of impacts on patients. It can affect productivity, Example, patients may miss school, work, it can affect sexual health, mental health, and the list goes on. So I'm trying to paint a picture here that perianal fistulas or perianal Crohn's disease can be one of the most disastrous phenotypes of Crohn's disease. So my next question for the group have you or your family member with perianal fistulas been able to achieve long-term healing? So you can see the answer is yes, but have experienced recurrence since then? Yes, and have not had any recurrence th since then, and so on. Okay, so we have 17% yes, but recurrence, and 22% um, no recurrence, and 24% no. So if you add the no, I have not been able to achieve healing, and yes, but recurrence, you can, again, this highlights that it's a very difficult disease process to treat. 
And so that's shown here by these studies. Most patients with perianal Crohn's disease will have multiple episodes. And even those that are able to achieve healing in the, major the majority of patients, the fistulas will recur. So again, this really hi highlights the refractory nature of this disease. So this is a study that we, that we presented at our major Canadian conference. Uh, it was actually last year, so 2020. And we asked the question, we wanted to determine the direct cost of care for patients with perianal Crohn's disease and compare that to the direct cost of care for patients with Crohn's disease, but without perianal manifestations. And so this is a very large Ontario wide study. It's called a population based study. And you can see here that at baseline, both groups of patients had nearly identical direct costs of care. And then if you fast forward to the year at the time of diagnosis of perianal Crohn's disease, you can see that the cost of care for these patients was substantially higher than patients without perianal fistulas. And so it was almost threefold higher and the cost remained at least twofold higher for the, for the remainder of the study. So this really highlights that it's a costly disease and it's putting a great strain on our healthcare system. So before we get into the treatment of fistulas, I hope you can appreciate that fistulas are common. They can cause a dramatic impact on patients. They're very difficult to treat and they can be costly. So how do we treat fistulas? Well, first of all, we have a number of goals. As a clinician, when I'm treating patients with perianal fistulas, I have a number of goals and these can be divided into short-term goals and long-term goals. By far and away, the most important short-term goal is to make sure that these abscesses are adequately drained. And so this may be surgically or by giving antibiotics and sometimes a combination of both. So when we're, when we're dealing with perianal Crohn's disease, it's important to point out that it really takes a team effort to effectively manage uh, and to get um, patients healed. And so it really requires a multidisciplinary approach with gastroenterologists and surgeons. And I don't think there's any better example of a phenotype of inflammatory bowel disease that really requires the interactions between, between different uh, disciplines. And so um, in Ottawa, where I work, we have ve a very close relationship with our surgeons. And it's important because when our patients develop these perianal abscesses, it's important to get what we call source control. Now the surgeons, after draining the abscess, they, all, they might also choose to put in what's called a seton. And a seton is a thread-like structure as shown here. And it's used, it's placed in the fistula tract with the idea of maintaining the fistula tract open. And that's important to prevent these infections from reaccumulating. And this will give time to have more uniform healing throughout the fistula tract so that when the seton is removed, you have a better chance of complete healing. So if we go back to our goals, short-term goal is to achieve drainage and to reduce the symptoms from the abscess. In the long term, we're trying to completely resolve any drainage from these fistula openings. We also aim to heal the fistulas and ultimately to improve quality of life for our patients. And in doing so, we hope to preserve continence and to avoid a definitive surgery where patients require diversion. So an ileostomy or a colostomy. So before we get into the specifics of treatment, the first step is we, we need to adequately evaluate the fistula tract. So when we're assessing patients, we look at the external surface, we can do a physical exam, but as I, as I tell many of my residents, the external exam is really only the tip of the iceberg, and it really doesn't tell us what's happening 
completely underneath. So in this situation here, you have it looks like there's an abscess. So it looks like there's a pimple. You can see the red area of the skin, but we really don't know what's going on underneath the surface of the skin. You might have a single fistula tract, or you might have a very complex branchy network of fistula tracts. And so because we can't see underneath the surface of the skin, we really need to rely on imaging tests. And so the best test of choice is an MRI scan. So the MRI is a surgeon's best friend, but it's also as a gastroenterologist, it helps us decide on how best to treat patients. So we want to know if there's an abscess that needs drainage. And this MRI scan can serve as a blueprint or a roadmap for the surgeons when they go in to try to drain the abscesses and then decide if they are going to put in the cetons, which I just mentioned. When we do an MRI scan, we can categorize fistulas as simple or complex. And this will become important when we're deciding on the best treatment for patients. So a simple fistula is shown here, and you can see that it's a very low-lying fistula that does not involve much of the anal sphincter or the anal muscle. In contrast, a complex fistula involves a lot of the muscle, and it may have an abscess, and there may be multiple fistulas or multiple branches. So the reason why it's important to differentiate between simple and complex fistulas is because the treatment is different. So here's an overview of what I think of when I'm treating a patient with perianal fistulas. First of all, it's essential to know if there's an abscess or not. If there is an abscess, this is when we get these surgeons involved and the surgeons are very helpful because they can go in and drain the abscess, and as I mentioned before, they may choose to put in a ceton into the fistula tract. Once the abscess has been drained adequately, that's when we can start to use medications to suppress the immune system. And typically we use a combination of therapy, which I'll discuss in more detail. In contrast to these complex fistulas, simple fistulas don't necessarily require all these steps. We may simply choose to use antibiotics or immunosuppressive medications. And then sometimes we can even use a surgical procedure to open up the fistula and allow it to heal from the inside. So this is called a fistulotomy. And the reason why we would not try a fistulotomy with a complex fistula is because you'd be cutting into too much muscle and that would, uh, patients would be at a very high risk of developing incontinence. So what medications do we have available? So here are the traditional medical options. We have antibiotics. Many of you will be well aware of our immunomodulator medications. So we have azathioprine as well as methotrexate. And then our best treatment option, the gold standard, is our biologics. And more specifically, it's the anti-TNF therapy, so anti-tumor necrosis factor therapy. And so many of you would be well aware of these medications. And this really represents our best line or our first line and best treatment for the perianal fistulas. And that's shown here. This was the very first clinical trial that found that the anti-TNF and more specifically Remicade was an effective treatment for perianal Crohn's disease. So this was a randomized control trial that was published back in 1999 in the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see before treatment started, this is a patient that had a fistula tract and you can see the external opening. And so this tract likely was draining either pus or feculent matter. And then now we see after two weeks, you can begin to get a sense that there's already healing. And then by 10 weeks, there's complete healing of the external opening of the fistula tract. And that healing was maintained beyond 
18 weeks. So this was the first trial that really showed we now have a medication with proven effectiveness for perianal Crohn's disease. And since then, there have been studies to show that not only is Remicade effective in the short term, but it also can maintain remission in the long term. And there are also other anti-TNF medications that have been shown to be effective, such as Humira. There's a problem with anti-TNF therapy though. And so this is a meta-analysis. And so for those of you who are not familiar with a meta-analysis, this is simply just a fancy statistical way that we can combine the results of multiple studies so that we have one summary estimate. And so when you combine the results of six controlled trials, they found that about 33% of patients achieve remission or healing of their fistulas after treatment with anti-TNF therapy. So only 33%. So there's a lot that can be approved, improved upon that. What's also very sobering is that even in the patients who achieved healing, only 34% of those patients achieved long-term remission. And even worse, if you were to do an MRI scan to, to check to see if the fistula completely healed radiologically, even fewer patients were able to achieve complete healing. So what does this show us? Number one, it shows us, it really points out, again, the refractory nature of this disease. It's very difficult to treat. But I think it also points out that even to this day, there is a large unmet need with our current medications. But there is hope. So there are strategies that we can use to improve fistula healing. And so this is probably one of the most important parts of the talk here. So anyone in the audience who have had problems healing their, their perianal fistulas, there can be reasons why it's difficult to heal. And some of these reasons we can potentially modify to improve success. So if you're only gonna remember one slide, this is probably the most important one. So if we think about the reasons why fistulas don't heal, well, the first and one of the most obvious ones is that the fistulas can be very complex. And so um, we're currently doing a, a multi-center study in Canada, and we also have some centers in the US, and we're trying to look at patient factors as well as radiographic factors from the MRI scans to see if we can predict which patients are more likely to heal versus which ones will not. Now, unfortunately, with complexity, you can't really do much about complexity. But we've also come to realize that if you have inadequate or very low levels of medication in your system, you're less likely to heal your fistulas. So this is something that we can modify. We can push the doses of our medications. Another important cause of a non-healing fistula is because there is a persistent infection or a persistent abscess that hasn't completely drained. So again, this is an example of where the gastroenterologist and the surgeons have to work together. And so there, there will be times where I will um, ask the surgeons to take another look and to drain any um, undrained abscess. The next idea is the concept of dysregulated inflammation. So what does this mean? Well, simply put, you can think that there are multiple different pathways that lead to inflammation. And so because we use these very targeted medications to block inflammation, we don't always block each and every one of the inflammation pathways. So it might mean in the future that we can use, combine different medications to improve or to achieve better healing. This next concept is one of the, the most commonly forgotten um, 
reasons for poor fistula healing. And I think it's probably the most important. And so this is the concept of a high pressure zone. So with Crohn's disease, because there is chronic inflammation, it can often lead to scarring. And when scarring occurs in the bowel, the bowel becomes more and more narrow. So the same thing can happen if there's inflammation in the anal canal. And so you can imagine if that anal canal became narrower, narrower, tighter, it's going to be more difficult for the stool to exit the proper way. And so if there's a high pressure zone because of this narrowing, this will cause the stool, it will force the stool into the fistula tract rather than out the normal exit. And so this is something that we can fix by repeated dilation of the anal canal. And so I often tell my residents when, they, when they're learning about perianal Crohn's disease, I tell them that always make sure to do a rectal exam to make sure there isn't narrowing in the anal canal. And if there is, it's going to be very, very hard to heal the perianal fistulas unless you deal with that. So the last concept is something known as epithelialization. And so I want everyone to think of uh, if you've had your ear pierced. So when you have your ear pierced, the hole that's created, it takes a while for that tract to mature. When that hole matures, you start to grow a little surface layer of skin over that hole. And once that happens, it's very difficult for that hole now to completely close. Well, the exact same thing can happen with these fistula tracts. And so this is again, another situa situation where we really rely upon surgeons for help. And so the surgeons can actually go in and they can, um, and they can what, do something what's called curatage. And that's kind of scraping the layer, that surface layer of skin from the fistula tract. And once that's done, it's felt that it's more likely now that the fistula tracts can close. So there are six possible reasons that I've listed here why fistula tracts don't heal, some of which we can potentially modify to improve healing. So let's look at some of the studies that support these, uh, these, these reasons. Well, first of all, this is a, an old study that was published back in 2003. It was a very small study, but what they wanted to do is that they asked the question, if we combine Remicade with a local surgical procedure, so if we do the two together compared to Remicade alone, can we help heal more fistulas? And so they look to see if the fistulas responded. And when you combine surgery with Remicade, you can see that there, is, there are higher rates of healing. And when you combine the two, it was less likely that the fistulas would recur. So because of this study and others, it's thought that, you know, it might be important to, um, to have that exam under anesthesia with the surgeons prior to beginning our anti-TNF therapy. So I must point out that these studies which led to this conclusion are very small and they're not formal randomized control trials. So we have to take this information with a grain of salt, um, but it's a potential way to help. So the next idea is combining our treatments, our anti-TNF therapy with antibiotics. And so this was a, an actual formal randomized controlled trial. And in this trial, they were using Humira as a treatment, Humira as an anti-TNF therapy. And they randomized patients to receive Humira with an antibiotic or Humira alone without an antibiotic. And Patients were given a very liberal course of antibiotics. They were given, they were treated with antibiotics for a full three months nonstop. And after that three month period, they looked to see how many patients responded, their fistulas that responded. And you can see here that with the combination of antibiotics and Humira, 
many more patients respond to treatment compared to using Humira alone. And then if we look over at complete healing of the fistula tracts, again, you can see that the combination of antibiotics and Humira works better than Humira alone. So this study tells us if we use antibiotics for a finite time, that that can improve fistula outcomes, at least in the short term. What we don't know is if that also translates to long-term healing. So even in this study, they look not only at 12 weeks, but also at 24 weeks. And you can see the difference between the two group starts to lessen. And so again, this brings into question if this strategy, early antibiotic use, will have a long-term impact. So the next study that I'm going to present and the final one for this part of the talk is this is a study that was presented at uh, one of our major international conferences back in 2016. And so the authors wanted to know if the concentrations of Remicade impacted healing. So they measured the levels of Remicade inside our patients' bodies and they looked at healing. And so here in the orange, these are the rates of fistula healing. And you can see that as the concentration of Remicade increases, so does the percentage of patients that achieved healing. And so it appears that the sweet spot is a Remicade level between 10 and 20. Anything over this value, and you don't really get much more of an added benefit to uh, Remicade. So this really changed our thought process with our anti-TNF therapy. And so most of us now are a lot more aggressive in pushing the doses of Remicade and Humira. Now, one of the things that my patients often ask me, well, if I'm increasing the doses of Remicade or Humira, is that not more risky? Am I at a higher risk of side effects? And, and the answer is so far we have not seen any added risk of, of side effects from, from increasing the dose of, of Remicade or Humira. So it's very encouraging. You may get a better clinical benefit, but without any additional risk. Okay, so unfortunately, not all of our treatment work, uh, treatments work all the time. And um, at times patients may need to go back and see the surgeons. So there are a number of local procedures that can be done to hopefully heal the, the fistula. We've talked about fistulotomies and that's where that's shown here where the surgeons will make an incision, open the fistula up and allow it to heal from the inside out. Again, the problem with a fistulotomy is that if you cut into too much of the muscle, the anal sphincter, patients will become um, continent. And so that, that, that's a huge problem. And because of this, we reserve these fistula, fistulotomies only when it's not involving a substantial amount of the anal sphincter. So for the vast majority of patients with fistulas, this is really not going to be an option. There have been other things that have been tried, such as fistula plugs. And initially there was great excitement, but with longer term studies, it does not appear that um, they're overly effective long-term. And so as a result, this is rarely performed anymore. The other, the next possibility is what's called an advancement flap. And so this is where the surgeons will actually dissect part of the tissue in the rectum and stretch it down over the internal opening of the fistula tract. And then the tissue will be sewn in place, hopefully healing this area and preventing, prevent allowing the rest of the, the fistula to heal. So this is a technique that can be performed for um, very selected patients. So it needs to be performed when there isn't any inflammation, uh, there can't be any inflammation in the rectum, otherwise this, this tissue will not heal. 
And the other limiting factor, if there's substantial narrowing in the anal canal, then this again is not, this technique is not possible. So unfortunately, these surgical techniques are not performed very commonly. There are times where patients just really can't get control of the fistula drainage. They have recurrent abscesses and we've gone through all treatments. And in these times, we may need to consider a more of a permanent solution. And that's what's called fecal diversion. And so this is where patients are given an ileostomy or a colostomy. And this allows the fecal matter to be diverted from the rectum. And this, it, this is one of our best solutions for treating perianal Crohn's disease that does not respond to medications. So this is a study that we, it's, it's going to be published very soon. And um, this was a, a, a multi-center Canadian effort. And so we, there were three centers in Canada and we pooled our, our patient data to see what happens for patients that underwent this fecal diversion surgery to see how effective it was in the modern era. And we were a little bit surprised in patients that had an ileostomy or a colostomy where the rectum was not removed, so the rectum was left in place, the rates of fistula healing was about 60%. So a little bit depressing. However, just because you don't have complete fistula healing, it doesn't mean that there wasn't a substantial benefit in terms of quality of life for these patients. So that's something to keep in mind. In contrast, for the patients who underwent a definitive surgery where the rectum was removed, the vast majority of these patients had complete healing of the perianal fistulas. So if we look back at this group where they have the fecal diversion without taking the rectum, the reason why that's done is it it's allows this process to be a temporary treatment meaning that if things are going well, you can potentially go back in with surgery and restore fecal continuity. And so in our study, 40% of patients underwent this bowel restoration to restore fecal continuity. Unfortunately, the results were not great. And so the vast majority of patients who had their bowel restored, the fistulas just came back. So we were, we were a little bit surprised and we were hoping that now in the era of these biologic treatments that we'd be able to overcome this, but it still shows again, I think I've said this three times now that this really highlights the refractory nature of this disease and it can be, it can be in some patients very difficult to treat. So enough bad news. What are some of the emerging treatments? So some of the hopeful uh, treatments that we have coming down the pipeline. So first of all, many of you will be aware that we now have more biologic medications that are available for the treatment of Crohn's disease. And so this includes Stelera and Intivio. And so even in patients where the anti-TNF therapy has failed, in this French study, it's the largest study that's been published to date, it showed that these medications may have a benefit for perianal Crohn's disease. So with Stelera, 40% of patients achieve success at six months. And with Intivio, also known as Vitalizumab, 20% of patients achieve success. So keep in mind that this, these are patients that have already failed other treatments. So this is encouraging. I don't want you to compare these two studies because they are different patient populations. And so it wouldn't be, um, we, we can't directly compare to determine if Stelera or Vitalizumab is better than the other. One of the one of the therapies that I'm really, really excited about is the idea of mesenchymal stem cells. So stem cells have been used to treat many types of inflammatory conditions. And so mesenchymal stem cells 
are harvested from patients from the fat pad of their abdomen. So you can get the, the stem cells from adipose tissue. And these are stem cells that can divide over and over again, but not forever. And so that's very important because if you're putting someone else's stem cells into your body, it's something that you have to be careful about because of the immune system. Um, in, in other words, if you were to do a heart transplant or a lung transplant, and you were to transplant someone's organ into yourself, um, you would, because that's a, that organ is uh, immunogenic, you have to be on immunosuppressive medications. Stem cells are different. These type of stem cells are different. These do not create a, an immune response that require us to be on specific immune suppressant agents. Now, stem cells have a number of, of important effects that can help with tissue healing. So first of all, stem cells can regulate the immune system. They can dampen the immune system. They can also move throughout the body to the site of injury. They can promote the production of, of um, blood vessels and they can promote the production of growth factors. So each of these are important for tissue regeneration. So because of this, it's believed that stem cells may be an important tool to help with healing. So there actually has been a very large clinical trial that was conducted in Europe that has shown the benefit of stem cells. So this is called the ADMIRE trial, and it was published in 2016. And so in this trial, all patients underwent a surgical exam. The surgeons used a suture to close off the internal opening. And then patients were either randomized to receive the stem cells or they received a placebo. So the treatments were injected into the internal opening and then also along the extent of the fistula. The study followed patients until week 24. And here in the orange, these are the patients that receive the stem cells. And in the gray, these are patients that receive placebo. Now it's important to note here that this is not a true placebo because each of these patients underwent the surgical exam where the fistula tracts would have, would have been curataged and the patients remained on their normal immunosuppressive therapy. So if they were on Remicade or Humira, that would, have, that would have continued. And so what they found from the study is that the group of patients that received stem cells, they were more likely to achieve healing of the fistula tracts, 51% compared to 35. And this fistula healing maintained long-term. And so this is very important as shown here. So in this clinical trial, you can see that at week 24, the rates of fistula remission remained long-term up to one year. And if we compare that to our current gold standard treatment, Remicade, you can see that you get a response initially, but that kind of dwindles off over time. So it's possible that stem cell therapy gives a very robust response. So currently, um, this was proposed to Health Canada. Unfortunately, Health Canada felt that um, more studies were required before they granted access to this medication. Um, the same thing happened in the US. And so there's now a second clinical trial that has just begun and it will be occurring at many sites in Canada. So I know in Ottawa, we have this trial and my colleagues in BC and Toronto, as well as um, some others also have um, of this study. So the last um, potential option that I'm gonna talk about today is the concept of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So this is something that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, so what is hyperbaric oxygen? 
So for hyperbaric oxygen, first of all, this is a treatment that has been shown to be effective for a number of disease processes, including helping to heal chronic wounds, such as diabetic wounds. And so what happens is patients will go in this chamber and in the chamber, the, the air will be pressurized. And so very similar if you were going diving. And in addition to this, patients breathe in oxygen. And so with the oxygen and the pressure, this will increase the concentration of oxygen in the bloodstream, and it will allow the oxygen to diffuse into tissue. And so this can have a number of beneficial effects. One, it's been shown that this can reduce inflammation. It can increase growth factors. It can mobilize stem cells. And so very similar to what I just mentioned for the mesenchymal stem cells. But in addition to this, the hyperbaric oxygen can help to kill bacteria. And so this is very important for perianal Crohn's disease where the process or the inflammation is driven by um, um, bacteria, bacteria. And so again, that's the reason why we often use combination therapy with antibiotics. So hyperbaric oxygen, very exciting. Um, it's a safe technique. The most common side effect of, of um, hyperbaric oxygen is what's called barotrauma. So if anyone has gone diving, it, can, you're, you, it feels like there's a lot of pressure behind the eardrums. Um, if there's too much pressure, that can cause your eardrums to pop. Um, but in terms of, it's, that's uncommon. And, um, and few other side effects from uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And there actually is some evidence that it might be effective. So this is another meta-analysis that we just presented this year at our national meeting. And so there have been 10 studies to date that have looked at the potential effectiveness of hyperbaric oxygen. So the first part here is looking at fistula response, and the second is looking at fistula remission. And I wanna remind you that in these studies, this includes patients, many of the patients in these studies had previously failed our standard therapy. So again, a pretty difficult patient population to treat. And so when we look at response, a total of 118 patients have been studied and 75% of patients responded to therapy. When we look at remission, 60% of patients have responded to therapy. So this is very encouraging, but I would caution you in interpreting these studies. They were very small. They did not contain controls. They, some of them didn't follow patients for very long. So we have to take this information with a grain of salt and we really, really need a randomized controlled trial to study this. So uh, we've talked about a lot tonight. Um, so in conclusion, I hope you can appreciate that perianal Crohn's disease is very common. It occur occurs in about 30% of patients with Crohn's disease. Our current medications are only moderately effective, but there are strategies that we can use to make them more effective. And then finally, I'm very excited because there are new treatments coming down the pipeline, and so there certainly is hope. So I will stop there. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. McCurdy. Um, we covered a lot of ground and definitely I learned a lot. I found the examples um, very, very helpful in terms of understanding what to expect. Um, clearly, this is a topic near and dear to many people um, because we actually have quite a few questions and we're going to try to cover as many as we can tonight. Certainly, if we don't um, answer your question, please feel free afterwards to write us at learn at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. Um, so let's jump right in so we can answer as many of those questions as possible. Our first question is, 
Are hemorrhoids a condition directly related to Crohn's or can there be other causes? And what are the treatment options? Yeah, so great, great, great question. Um, so hemorrhoids are separate from Crohn's disease, but they can be worsened by Crohn's. So uh, anyone can develop hemorrhoids with excessive strain or increased stool frequency. So as you can imagine, our patients that uh, have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis where they have frequent bowel movements, that can bring on hemorrhoids. It is a different condition. In terms of treatment options, I always tell patients there's a, a number of important things. So one is when you, when you have a bowel movement, you want to avoid straining. Number two is you want to add bulking agents to your stools to, to make them easier to pass. And so that might be the addition of fiber. One of the misconceptions with inflammatory bowel disease is that fiber is bad, and which is not true um, at, at all, unless you have tight strictures. Um, the other important thing when you're having bowel movements, you want to take advantage of the contractions of your colon to help you with bowel movement. So many of us, um, because it may not be a socially acceptable time to go have a bowel movement, run to the toilet, we often try to hold it in until we finish classes or finish work or, or whatnot. But it's better to, if you can, um, especially patients that have constipation, you want to, um, um, you want to make sure you use that when you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. The other thing that can be very helpful is improving the anal rectal angle. So all of us have this, um, the anal rectal angle, and it's important to help us maintain continence. But if we aren't using our muscles properly, and we don't relax that angle, then that can put unnecessary strain on the bottom and, and, can, and can put more pressure on hemorrhoids. And so one of, the, one of the things that you can do is use what's called a squatty potty. And so if you just get a stool in front of your toilet, you put both, you put your feet on and that will put you in a squatting position. And that improves that anal rectal angle and allows the bowel movement to exit without causing added pressure. If you have um, constipation, you should be using treatments to relieve that constipation. And finally, this is an important thing. If you have Crohn's disease, you're already at risk of developing perianal fistulas. Be very careful with surgery for hemorrhoids. If you have surgery to repair the hemorrhoids or even put elastic bands on the hemorrhoids, that can increase your risk of developing perianal fistulas. Great, thank you. Our next question is, um, I have issues with leakage after I have a bowel mo movement, is that normal? I guess the question is, where's the leakage coming from? And if it's leakage coming from the perianal fistula or just leakage in general, um, if it's leakage coming from the perianal fistula, very common, that's when most people do have leakage. And really strategies that we talked about to help completely heal that perianal fistula are important. If you have leakage just from the bottom end, that's um, a, a whole other story and that's uh, a lecture in and of itself, but that can be related to poor muscle tone. It can be related to liquid bowel movements. And so there's a number of things that can be done there, but it's, that's a, a long discussion. And I'm just going to do a little checkpoint. Um, it's eight o'clock and I'm hoping you have a little bit more time to cover some of the questions. I, I'm happy to stay, yeah. Awesome. Um, so the next question, once you have had anal fissures, are you more prone to them in the future? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it's important to distinguish between anal fissures and um, ulcers in that area. And so um, they can be completely different mechanisms. So for anal fissures, typically the treatment is we use a, a medication that increases blood flow to the area and to really make sure that the bowel movements are soft, again, by adding fiber and using stool softeners, where, whereas if, the, uh, if the, around the perianal area, 
if you have ulcers, well, that's often because of active Crohn's disease. And you want to take a look at the medications to make sure that your medications have been optimized. And when I say medications in that regard, I mean medications that suppress the immune system. Is there any way to prevent abscesses from forming within perianal fistula tracts or how to get rid of them? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so um, how to get rid of an abscess? If you do have an abscess, um, it's either antibiotics and, um, and surgical drainage. Those are the two most important ways to get rid of the abscess. And you can use a combination of both. Again, I use liberal amounts of antibiotics. So unlike most other conditions, whether it's a skin infection or a, a, a respiratory tract infection where antibiotics might be given for a week, I typically give antibiotics for a month or two months or three months. Um, when you have an abscess, um, if it, it can be dangerous because it can lead to sepsis. So, um, surgical drainage is often required. Um, if you have abscesses and you get frequent abscess, the way one of the strategies that can be used to prevent them is the placement of cetons, which we, we discussed. So those are those threads that get placed through the fistula tract. They come out the, your, your anal canal, they're tied together and they stay in place. And again, the rationale for that is if you prevent closure of the external opening of the, of the fistula tract, it will allow drainage to occur and it won't allow the infection to accumulate. So those are possible ways, but ultimately we would hope to heal the fistula tract completely so that these abscesses don't, um, don't recur. And that can be through medications such as Remicade or Humira, possibly the other biologics, maybe local surgical intervention. And then hopefully we, we get access to um, mesenchymal stem cells or some of these other um, treatments. Are there any warning signs or predictors of developing a fistula? Yes, absolutely. So um, you can imagine very similar to when we were teenagers and we had, uh, we had large pimples, the same thing. It's going to be, it's going to be sore, painful. It will feel like a pimple. If you're sitting down, it may feel like you're sitting on a golf ball. Um, but if it's a really deep fistula, you may not, you may not feel, um, you may not feel a, a large pressure when you're sitting down. So if you have a fever or if you're just feeling really unwell and you have generalized pain in that perianal area, those are signs and predictors. And then next, what comes first for problematic fistula site? Increasing your biologic dose or putting in aceton? Uh, excellent question. Excellent, excellent question. So this, um, in my talk, I presented as being pretty straightforward that you combine the, the OR ceton and then put a biologic. Um, and, but it's, it's probably not that simple. And so the reason I say that we've looked at, uh, we've looked at this information at the Ottawa hospital and um, we did not see um, a dramatic improvement with um, putting in cetons and, um, and, and then using biologics compared to patients who had biologics alone. Now, first of all, the problem with studying this is that you can imagine that people that go to the operating room are likely going to have more complex fistulas, which are going to be more difficult to treat to begin with. So I think, I think the, the bottom line is that we need more research in this area. But to answer your question and to give you a, a practical answer for this question, what I would say for the what I would say, if your fistula is problematic, it's not healing. You may talk to your gastroenterologist 
about one, examining you to see if there's a potential abscess and potentially repeating the MRI. If doing those and it's felt that there is an abscess, no question then you want to go to the OR first and put a CTON in before um, increasing your biologic. If there isn't, if you do the MRI and there is not a, there is not a abscess, then I think it would be in that situation, it'd be very reasonable to increase your biologic. Fantastic question. And another one, what are the treatment options for fistulae that appear all around the perineum and the groin area? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question um, as well. And so there's a couple of possibilities for that. Um, so that one, uh, one possibility is that you've had a large abscess and now, and, and think back um, for the audience, think back to when you were younger and you, um, you had acne, if you had a large, um, a large pimple, I mean, really what your body's trying to do is there's an infection there and your body's trying to push that out to the surface so that it can drain the, the infection. And so the same thing happens with the perianal area. So if you have a large, if you have a large abscess, you might start to develop multiple, multiple exit sites. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is that, um, is that this is related to a condition called hydradenitis suppurativa. So HS, this is a dermatologic condition and it's actually been shown that this dermatologic condition is much more common in patients with Crohn's disease than without. And so uh, these patients typically develop, they can develop boils underneath their armpits, possibly underneath the breast, as well as in the groin and the perianal area. So that's another possibility. And for that, if there's any thought, you um, should be connected with a dermatologist. However, that being said, the treatment for perianal fistula and the treatment for hydradenitis suppurativa is the same. So both of them use the anti-TNF therapy. The final thing that I would say, and it, and it might be, again, talk to your gastroenterologist, but when you have lots of problems with the skin around the perianal area and the groin, it might actually be a dermatologic condition known as metastatic Crohn's disease. And so for that, you may also want to see a dermatologist, but again, the treatment of choice is going to be our anti-TNF therapy. Great. And the next question is really a perspective around natural remedies and treatments available. Uh, great question. And um, so a lot of my patients ask about cannabis. Does that help? And the answer is we just don't know yet. Um, are there any herbal products that can help, ointments that can help? The problem with anything topical is you're on the surface of the bottom and that's really not the problem area. It's underneath in the tissue um, and um, in the internal opening of, um, of, of, of the rectum. So topical therapies, probably not gonna be overly helpful. Um, dietary changes, if dietary changes can lead to healing of inflammation and bowel, great, that could potentially help. Um, but again, these are very, very difficult to, uh, to heal A natural, maybe the hyperbaric oxygen that we've been talking about. So hyperbaric oxygen, although oxygen is, um, I mean, we all breathe it in. And so that's fairly natural where we are using higher concentrations of oxygen than normal, but that's a potential way that, um, it's. We're, we're not talking about immunosuppression. We're not talking about medications that, um, that, uh, that are required long-term. So um, you can think of that maybe as a, a natural product. 
And the next question is, is there a way to stop perianal skin tags from reoccurring? Great question. Um, so, um, so perianal skin tags, uh, very, very common in patients with Crohn's disease, but also um, in, in, in patients with or people without um, Crohn's disease. One of the mechanisms that whereby it's thought to occur is from um, hemorrhoidal tissue. And, um, but in Crohn's disease, it, it can occur even in the absence of hemorrhoidal tissue. Um, they can become inflamed and very irritating in that situation by using, by treating the inflammation that in and itself can relieve the irritation and can cause some of the swelling of the skin tags to go down. But they're, once the skin tags are there, they're not going to go away. And this is another example where I would not re um, recommend the surgeons removing them surgically. I would be worried about developing perianal fistulas and abscesses by doing that. And are there any treatment options for fecal in incontinence? It really depends on what the cause of, of fecal incontinence. So um, one, um, if as we get older, we start to lose some of that muscle tone in our anal sphincter, it is extremely common. And uh, everyone, you'd be shocked at how common it is. It's, it, there's a lot of stigma attached. So we don't typically talk to our friends about it, but it is very common. It's even more common in women who have had multiple pregnancies with vaginal deliveries, especially if there were there were third and fourth degree tears. Um, if you've had a fistulotomy procedure, the surgical, uh, surgical procedure, that can lead to incontinence. Um, so a couple of things that you can do. One is try to add bulk to your stools. If you don't have as much anal sphincter tone, then you can imagine it's gonna be even more difficult to hold in liquid as it is solid stool. So adding bulking agents like fiber can be helpful. Um, and then um, increasing the, the muscle by doing Kegel exercises, that can be helpful. And, but it's uh, fecal incontinence is very difficult to manage. So I'm not sure if we have any more questions. I'm just gonna call it to Sarah. Okay, so I think we've covered as much as we can tonight. Um, we'd love to hear from you in terms of the webinar and the value you got from the webinar. I certainly, like I said, I learned a lot and I just loved the examples that you gave Dr. Dr. McCurdy because you really helped us understand what to expect and um, you know the experience that's, that many of our viewers go through. Um, I'd like to first start by thanking Dr. McCurdy for spending his time with us today to share his expertise and to help answer many, many questions. And a big thank you as well to, to Mike and to Dave who did our translation behind the scenes, to Sarah and Emily who um, help with all the Q&As and all of the logistics behind the event tonight. And of course, to Kate, who has left for the day for helping to moderate. Um, a big thank you to all of you for joining us and spending your night with us at our Gutsy Learning series. Um, just a big plug, of course, if you can follow our social media at Get Gutsy Canada. Um, a thank you too to Rosemary, who behind the scenes is texting out a lot of the, the uh, information um, through Twitter uh, tonight. And if you can, um, help support our fundraising by texting CURE to 20222 to donate $25 to help fund research. And of course, I always like to do a plug for Gutsy Walk, our annual fundraiser, our annual event. It's a big community event that will happen again this year in June, June 6. If you can join us, um, we'd love you to be there. Um, it connects the community from coast to coast, and you can find out more at gutsywalk.ca. 
So thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone involved for, again, a really uh, wonderful session. Um, hopefully many of your questions were addressed. If they weren't, please feel free to email us at learn at uh, Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. We hope you come and join us again for another learning session or one of our COVID and IBD uh, webinars that um, happen each month. And until we see you again, stay safe and all the best. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angie. Okay. Thank you.